I would like all of you now to welcome Mike Warnke, the world's greatest Christian comedian. Give him a warm welcome, would you? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Heavens, you know how you get to, to be the world's best at anything? You just get to be the only guy that's doing this jazz, you know? <laughs> and actually, the reason I'm the only guy that's doing this jazz is because nobody really has guts enough to look like me uh, or sound like me or go some of the places I go, you know? Uh, I quit kidding myself about my looks a long time ago because I guess I realized that you don't have to be good looking or skinny to get into heaven, which if it was the case, I'd be out on both counts, you know, because I'm sort of, I, it, that's the shame about being fat and ugly. There's so much more ugliness there, you know, and uh, uh, it's like me, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I've gotten to the place where I know that the Lord loves me anyway, so it doesn't depress me when I shave anymore, you know, because I, I, I had to get up every morning and shave this face, and I know that I look, you know, I got a face, you can shove my face in a bowl of dough and make gorilla cookies, you know, and, uh, uh, and uh, if, it was just, if it was just cuteness, I, I'm afraid I'd just have to go to that other place, you know, uh, and so... I don't, I don't really mind that. I, I want to apologize to those of you that don't know me for not being what you expected. Because I know what you expected, because I watched the late movie too, you know. And anybody that's supposed to be an ex-Satanist, you know, and have done all the rotten, horrible, mean, awful, bodaciously bad things that I've done should look a lot different than me. Most people expect a cross between Bella Lugosi and Billy Graham, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> They expect me to arrive in a long black car, you know, and crawl out of a coffin and be about seven foot four and about 85 pounds, you know, and have these six inch fangs on both sides of my, and fly in, in, in the door, you know, and hang upside down uh, from the rafters over the pulpit and say, I'm so glad you've come to the meeting, you know. Uh, you sound like, you know, sound like somebody that escaped from a Gary Paxton record, you know, and, uh, uh, I didn't sound that way before I became a Christian. I'm certainly not going to do that stuff now, you know. I mean, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was not being a Satanist priest or a, or a pimp or a pusher or a lot of the things that I did. As a matter of fact, uh, he's been allowing me to talk about a lot of different things other than my testimony. You know, we did the first record that we did was a, a, a lot of my testimony, a lot of my life story and how I used to be all these bad things, you know. And then it had a happy ending. Uh, because I, I got to, to, to meet the Lord, you know. And now it's been so long since I've been a Christian. You know, I've been saved for 11 years now, going on my 12th year, which is kind of an earmark year for me because I've never stuck with anything for 12 years except Jesus, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, so the Lord has got me to the place where I spend less and less time talking about how things used to be, and I spend more and more time talking about what things are like now. Because like I say, the most important thing to me was not being a Satanist and all those rotten things, but the most important to me, thing to me is the fact that I did meet Jesus 12 years ago and the fact that he did come into my life and he did change me and he did make all things new. And so really tonight, I'm not so much here to talk about the devil as I am here to talk about Jesus. And that's what I really want to talk about. And that's what I really want to talk to you about, because that's what I have the most fun doing. And uh, what's, one of the things that's really blessed me is uh, I found out that in order to talk like Jesus, you don't have to look like everybody else that's talking like him too, you know. And if he puts a calling on your life, he knows everything there is to know about you in advance of that calling. And the Bible says that the gifts and callings of God were, are without repentance. That means if the Lord gives you a, a calling on your life, he's never going to be sorry he did it. Because he knew you from the beginning. He's always known you and he's known what you're going to do. And so he doesn't want you wasting your time running around trying to be something you're not. He wants you to fulfill that thing that he gave you because he knows that you're the only person in the entire kingdom of God that can do that thing. Because if you weren't, he would have given it to somebody else. You see? So it's real, real important that we realize our potential in the Lord and not spend a lot of time, you know, goofing up. Oh, I remember the first time, I mean, I, I tried to to fit in, you know, I remember the first suit I ever had, you know, I think in my first album, I called it a, a, a Dave Wilkerson suit, and uh, I had to kind of uh, uh, illuminate on that a little bit. It was dark blue, 
uh, and it was double everything. It was double knit, double vested, double breasted, double buttoned, had two inch cuffs, two zippers on both pair of pants. You know, I'm telling you, it was, it was a full dress suit and I had all these uh, evangelist accessories to go with it. You know, a white tie and a white belt and a pair of white buck shoes with Pat Boone's picture on the toe of each one. And, uh, and you know, when I, when I went and did my preacher lessons, I, you know, I really put my heart into it, you know, and I, I spent a lot of time practicing doing the huzz, you know. You know what the huzz are. That, if, you, if you said, <laughs> some of you go to that, yeah, okay. <laughs> the huzz, like if you were going to say punctuation, you know, like if you were going to say a period, you would say hi. <laughs> and if you're going to say a question mark, you would say, how are you? Nyeh. You know, and if you were going to say an exclamation point, you'd say, huh, you know, and if you're an evangelist, you say it, huh, you know, and you put a little body English with it because you want people to really believe what you're saying, you know, and so it comes out sort of like this. Well, bless God, huh, we're here tonight, huh, to talk about the love of God, huh, you know, and uh, real, real impressive, you know, and then, uh, I, uh, then, about, uh, then I, I also practice doing the chicken walk a lot. And uh, the chicken walk is after you do every seventh hunt or so, you jump back from the pulpit and jerk all over to show people that you got the Spirit of God on you. And that goes like this. Well, bless God, huh? We're here tonight, huh? To talk about the love of God, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things that's, uh, you know, it's one of those things that's real impressive. And, uh, uh, now, don't get me wrong, if God gets you to doing stuff like that, you go ahead and do it. But if you have to practice it, you ain't got it. You know what I mean? And uh, I had to practice it because I did not have it, you know. And I, I had that silly old preacher haircut, you know. It was sort of like comb cotton candy. I used seven cans of hairspray on my head a day, you know. If I had a fallen down, my hair would have broken off, you know. It was a mess, you know. First time I ever tried to preach that way, it was a total flop. And I went home and I, and I, I had to get hold of God to see what was happening, you know. And uh, I got down on my knees to pray. Now, the reason I got down on my knees to pray was because things were going bad. If things were going good, I would have stood up to pray because the only time that you can really feel like standing up to pray is when things are cool because when things are bad and you're weighted down, that's when you hit the floor, you know. And uh, also, I, I prayed a very simple prayer because when things are going bad, you never have time to pray them King James prayers, you know. You can only, <laughs> you can only, you can only pray King James prayers standing up, you know what I mean? And you stand there and go, well... Bless Godeth. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lordeth. We knoweth that thou arteth, heareth, becauseth, Lordeth. You loveth thy childreneth, Lordeth. And you're just going to showereth us with a lot of blessing us, us. Godeth praiseth youeth in the heavenly places, us, us Lordeth. You know, and uh, I don't know. Maybe it would help if you held four marbles in your mouth when you pray. You know? <laughs> no, you can, you can do all that when things are cool, but when things are bad, you just hit the floor and your prayer sounds something like this. God! And, uh, uh, things were going so bad I, I, when I got home I hit the floor in the hall and slid into the bedroom you know, and I landed up against the bed with my elbows up on the bed and I said God what are you doing wrong and he looked down and he said not me it's you and I said I said, God, I, I thought I was doing your will. He said, no, you're not doing my will. You're doing your own will in my name. And I said, well, what's the difference, Lord? He said, results. And you know what? He was right. He, he, he was right. I, I never did get results until I started doing what the Lord wanted me to do. And I never started getting results until I, until I started operating the way the Lord wanted me to operate. And I never started getting results in my ministry until I started saying the things that the Lord wanted me to say, you know. I didn't realize I had been religious about one thing or another all my life, and so have you. I mean, if you are, are or were a dope smoker, and you do it all the time, and that's the only way you can get your head and get yourself together, and that's the only way you can maintain during the day, the only way you can get your act together is to get up and toke a couple of numbers before you go to school or you go to work or whatever you do, then dope is your God. Because anything you get strength and substance for, the, the thing that you turn to in your hour of need, that's your God. And if you're a dope smoker on that level, then you are a religious dope smoker. You see what I mean? 
And when I was a Satanist, man, I used to give sacrifices to the devil. And I used to bow down before him. And, you know, I got a three-inch cut on my arm here where my friends used to bleed my blood into a cup and drink it, you know. I mean, I was a religious Satanist. You see what I mean? And you can be religious about anything. I mean, you can be religious about your bank account. Amen? I mean, a lot of people have that big green God with George Washington on the front, you know. Oh, George. <laughs> Almighty George, you know. Uh, thou bring us all everything, George, you know. Praise God, George, you just provided me that Cadillac. Man, you can be religious about your job. You can work yourself to death. Uh, you can be religious about anything. And religion never got anybody anywhere. And you can run around this country and find religious people from morning till night and never find one of them that knows what God is all about, what the real honest-to-goodness God is all about. And, you know, I, I travel around the country so much, I, I have a chance to run into a lot of religious folks, you know. And... Uh, like I remember one time I was going through Chicago and it was in the wintertime and I had this fur hat of mine on. Now this fur hat of mine is made out of bunny fuzz. Uh, and bunny fuzz is the hair that comes on rabbits. And uh, what, what happened was, is, uh, I, I just thought maybe he didn't know. Anyway, uh, uh, I was down at Taos Pueblo uh, and I had gotten this hat from the Indians. They had made it up for me and it was all made out of rabbit fur and we had eaten the rabbits before we made the hat, you know. And uh, I had this hat on. You know, I'm not noted for dressing like your average preacher, uh, depending on where you come from. But uh, I was going through the uh, Chicago airport in my normal clothes, which was my bunny fuzz hat, which has also has a big silver concho on this side, about the size of a small baby moon, and uh, four ermine tails hanging down here and a feather sticking straight up, okay? <laughs> and then I had on this buckskin coat with a lot of beadwork on it and a pair of moccasins that come up to the knees with my pants tucked in the top. Uh, you just your normal everyday uh, reverend rig. And uh, I was um, blitzing on through the airport and this little uh, uh, chick came up to me and she said, uh, Hare Krishna, 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 Rama, 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 Krishna, Krishna, Hare Rama, Krishna, 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 Rama, Rama, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. I said, wait a minute, did I win? <laughs> and she said, uh, what do you mean, did I win? I said, well, you sound like a jukebox. It just paid off, you know? <laughs> and she says, um, and then she spotted the hat and she said, Ooh, where'd you get that hat? And I said, ooh, I got it from the Indians at Taos Pueblo. She said, ooh, what's it made of? And I said, ooh, bunny fuzz, you know. <laughs> she said, you know, and they're real religious, and they don't believe in eating meat or touching leather or anything of a dead animal, you know, like that. And she said, ooh, you'd wear the skin of a dead animal on your head? And I said, ooh, you bet. And she said, <laughs> she said, ooh, what for? And I said, ooh, it keeps my wigwam, you know. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, she said, uh, <laughs> she says, ooh, don't you know God don't want you to eat meat? And I said, ooh, how come he put the wrong kind of teeth in my mouth then? <laughs> Did you ever, you know, that's the truth there, you know. Uh, see, the thing about it is, is we all got teeth like dogs. You know, they're called canine teeth and they're for holding and ripping and cutting on meat. And if we were all supposed to be vegetarians, then we would have teeth like cows. Now, if you want to be a vegetarian, go ahead, but don't say God told you to because he didn't, because he didn't equip you that way. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? And these people have made a religion out of not killing cows. And this one girl really told me this. She said, if you eat meat, it's like eating your own mother. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, you trying to tell me my mom's a cow? <laughs> I said, I have checked my whole family tree and there ain't a Holstein in the herd. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, you meet all kinds of religious people. I had this real religious friend one time and he was like into Buddhism and a lot of other junk. And uh, he was like into this really macrobiotic trip, you know, and he, he just, you know, he thought he would get to heaven if, you know, he just subsisted on uh, lychee nuts and, and uh, bean sprouts and yogurt. I think he thought uh, like uh, Yule Gibbons was a prophet or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, he... Uh, <clears throat> He was really into this thing of not eating meat. Uh, another thing, I don't know why it is, all these religions hit you in the Big Mac right in the first place, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so he didn't eat meat either. And uh, it was really freaky. And one day I wanted to find out what it was that he was into, you know? So I asked him what he was trying to achieve. And he told me that what he was trying to achieve was that he wanted to get to a place called Nirvana. Now, reincarnation to me is a bum trip anyway. I mean, who wants to come back here? You know what I mean? I mean, do you really want to come back here? 
you know, I don't want to come back here. There's a whole lot of things that I don't want to go through again. You know what I mean? I mean, who wants to go through potty training again? Huh? <laughs> who wants to? Who wants to get zits again? I mean, you know what I mean? Your first blind date, yuck. <laughs> Senior English, right? I mean, who wants it? Who needs it? I want to go on to be with the Lord. I don't want to be stuck here, you know. I, I feel sorry for people that are into reincarnation. They must feel like one of those little squirrels in the cage, you know. They just boogity, 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 and they don't go anywhere. Did you ever notice that one of those squirrels, he never goes anywhere until he stops? Then he goes... <laughs> And most people that are into religion, they just boogity, 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 and they don't get anywhere. When they stop to take a look, it slings them off in the road somewhere, you know. <laughs> so my friend wanted to get to this place called Nirvana, so I wanted to find out about it, you know. And I said, well, where is it? And he says, well, it's nowhere. I said, what? He says, it's the state of perfect nothingness. I said, oh, Iowa. <laughs> and he said, no. He said, it's nowhere. I said, yeah, right outside Des Moines. He said, no, you don't understand. It's a spiritual plane where you achieve this spiritual plane, see? And you're up in this spiritual plane and you're at one with the cosmos and all the energy of the everything comes in and fills you with the uttermost. And there you are and you are nowhere and you've achieved nothing. I said, oh, that's far out. <laughs> I said, say, man, if you could get nothing from me, would you go and have a Big Mac with me? He said, if you could give me perfect nothing, then I would, I would just go and have a Big Mac with you. And I said, well, I have nothing right here in my hand. I'm looking at it real close, and I don't see any flaws in it, so you take it, and let's go eat. <laughs> you know? And you wonder about people, and you say, oh, yeah, but Brother Mike, that's simple. That's, that's easy to detect, you know? It's not enough to just flatten your fanny on a church pew someplace. It's not enough to sit around thinking about doing good. It's not enough to not smoke, not drink, not wear makeup, not wear short dresses, uh, not be going to the wrong places, not cussing, not, 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 not. It's a not enough for all of you to just not do the don'ts. You have got to do some of the do's. You have got to get out there and give or your Christianity isn't worth any more than the bumper sticker on your car. And if you got the kind of Christianity that only takes into itself, then you need to get yourself a razor blade and some hot water and take that bumper sticker off your car. You need to pull them big old 40-pound crosses off your neck and just throw them away. You need to take your Bible and stick it at home in a shelf where it won't offend people and stay home on Sunday morning. Just get out of the way. Don't claim to be a Christian if all you are is religious. And don't be satisfied with being religious if you really want more. Because you don't have to be. And people keep coming in to me and saying, Oh, Brother Warren Key, I just want to be so strong for God, but every time I try it, why, the devil just gets a victory over me. Uh -huh. Fooey. <laughs> the devil never gets any victories over you that you don't let him get. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That means you win, man. You win. I mean, you see people out at football games screaming and yelling themselves purple, and on Sunday morning, they look like they've lost their best friend. Or they look like they dried up and died. Or they look like they've been sucking a green persimmon for six years. <laughs> Chicks looks like they got their makeup on upside down. Dudes look like they got baptized in bad vinegar. It's a bum trip, you know. They all look like they died a week ago. They just haven't got the good grace to lay down anywhere. You know? <laughs> and it's weird, man. And they're going around, well, bless God, we're all saved, and it just thrills our hearts. Whoopee, you know. <laughs> I don't know about you, man, but I want to be alive when the Lord comes, man. I want to be doing something for Jesus. I don't care if it's making mistakes, you know. <laughs> I mean, I want to be boogieing for the Lord. But I want to be alive when the Lord comes, because I think I'm going to be alive in the flesh, because I think he's coming back real soon. So there's no sense being alive in the flesh and dragging a dead spirit around or a dead soul, you know. I want to be boogieing, man. And when the Lord comes and I start going up into rapture, man, I'm going to reach out and grab a sinner in both hands. And as, and as we zip through the clouds, man, I tell you, <clears throat> I'm going to grab them sinners, man. We're going to start zipping up through them clouds. I'm going to look at them old boys and say, do you guys get saved or do I let go? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that's going to be it. That's going to be. 
that's going to be a real hard uh, uh, witness to follow, you know. And uh, the people say, well, I would like to live like that, Brother Mike, but uh, I can't. You're right. You can't. You can't. I can't. Do you think I have the strength to do what I do? And do you think that I would love you if, if, if it was left to me to do it all by myself? There are people out there with short hair, man. <laughs> I mean, all of us long hairs are always talking about how the short hairs are always prejudiced against us. Hey, man, don't con me. I know how you feel about them. You know what I mean? And it, it is not in me to love guys with short hair. It is not in me to love guys who are what I call rednecks. It is not in me to love the conservative, formal type person. It is not in me to love those kind of people. But I do. I have those kind of friends all over the world. And I, I, I sup with those people and I break bread with them and I enjoy fellowship with them. You know why? Because God is bigger than my prejudices. That's why. And because the kind of God, love that God gives you is something that you can't shove down into a box no matter how hard you try. And the only person that even will make you think that it's worth trying to do it is the devil because he wants to rob you of the joy of what you have. Too much was paid for what you have for you to dis dishovel it off. And people say, oh, man, just Jesus. Is that all? Just Jesus. Just Jesus. <laughs> well, I don't know, Brother Mike. I don't know if that really is enough. I just don't know if, uh, you know, that's really enough. I mean, I don't, I don't know if Jesus dying on the cross was enough to really do it. You know what I mean? You know what that is? That is a lie of the devil. There really is a devil? Yep. Now, I'm not saying there's a cat running around with long red underwear with a pointy tail and plastic <laughs> horn sticking off his head with a pitchfork ready to gig you every time you do something wrong. But there really, honestly, to goodnessly, is a devil. And he has been around for a long time. You know, he made Eve goof up. Poor old Mama Eve. She was just hanging around there in the garden, got to Hungary's, and the devil was going <laughs> over here, you know. And there's this big old tree with some kind of fruit on it. We always say it was an apple, but it doesn't say what that fruit was, you know. I think it was a peach, because I like peaches better than apples anyway. And if I was going to get tempted by something, you could tempt me with a peach before you could an apple. I don't know. what. Maybe it, was a, maybe it was an avocado. Who knows? But anyway, it was some kind of fruit. And he tricked Eve, and she ate it. And ever since then, male chauvinism has been around. Because men like to say, it was a chick that got us in all of this trouble. <laughs> Some fruity chick, you know. But I got news for you guys. It just wasn't a lady, you know. Adam had to do it too. It was a combination act of a chick that didn't know a line when she heard one and a dude that didn't know when to keep his mouth shut, you know. <laughs> so it was a dual act. And, 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 and the devil came into the garden and last things up for Adam and Eve, but but you know, God wasn't going to leave him alone, so he came down and he said, now you have to leave the garden and you have to do all this because you broke my commandment. But I'm not going to leave you without hope because someday I'm going to send a Messiah. What he said, someday he says, there's going to be a fellow born. He's going to be the seed of the woman and he's going to crush your head, devil. Now this flipped the devil out. See, if I got done here and I'm sitting up here and I'm saying, now look, brother, I want to tell you something. As soon as I get done with this sermon, I'm going to drag you outside and crush your head. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I like, you got, you got, you got three ways to go with this. You can either run, talk me out of it, or you can be the crush or before you become the trushy, or you can make me stomp your sister. Anyway, uh, and or girlfriend or whatever she is. Anyway, uh, the devil had the same three options. And so he began to fight. And every time God would come up with a plan, well, the devil would be right there to last it up. Now, man, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Satan looked down into that crib and he said, this is the cat. This is the one that's supposed to stomp my head. Everything I've tried to do no matter how I've tried to louse God up, he's always been one step ahead of me. 
And so here's this Jesus cat, and he's the Messiah. And if I'm ever going to get away from getting my head stomped, i got to get rid of this kid. Well, he couldn't do anything to Jesus while he was young because the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord hovered over Jesus and he grew in the admonition of the Lord and in learning and in teaching and God overshadowed him with his protection and nothing happened to him. Satan knew that he couldn't get to Jesus directly. So what he had to do is he had to go and he had to corrupt the people around Jesus. And he did a real good job of it. And if you'll notice when you read the word that Satan didn't try and corrupt the street people. He didn't try and go to the garbage people and corrupt them, at least not the ones that Jesus has touched with his love. He went to the religious folks. He corrupted the church against the Lord. And the nice religious folks, one night they arrested the Lord while he was at prayer. They trumped up a bunch of false charges against him. They had a mockery of a trial. They handed him over to the Roman government. And the Roman government, in an order to please them and try and, uh, you know, keep things at rest with these uh, hot-headed Jews, decided that they would uh, give a little punishment to Jesus. He'd been accused of treason. He'd been accused of blasphemy. He'd been accused of so many things that, you know, it's like he was really framed good. So the Roman governor decided, well, he says, you know, I'll placate these Jews and I'll take this guy out and have him scourged and that should be enough for anybody. So they tied Jesus like a criminal and they drug him out to a place called the Court of the Pavements. And in the middle of the Court of the Pavements, there's a post. And at the top of this, this tall finger column of, of wood, there's a big ring. And this thing is called a scourging post. And they take the rope that ties Jesus' hand, see, and they throw the end of the rope through the ring on the top of this post. And then they pull down on that rope until they got Jesus suspended by his arms until nothing is touching the ground but his tiptoes. They tie the rope off. Or they step back and they rip Jesus' robe off his back. And they see that his skin is nice and tight so that when the scourge hits him, that it'll be sure to rip and bleed and tear, that it just won't be wasted motion. Then they bring out the scourge itself. And if there was any more diabolical instrument of torture than the scourge in those days, I don't really think I could think of what it would be. But because the scourge was a whip with one handle and a lot of tongues, and all down the length of each tongue of the scourge, there was a piece of metal tied or bone or, or stick, something sharp and jagged, old pieces of metal, and the tip of each one of the tongues of the scourge was tipped off with lead. And the man that was carrying this scourge was a man who was in charge of the entire disciplinary actions taken against the whole Roman legion that was there in Jerusalem. He was kind of like the sergeant of arms. Big old muscled guy who'd flogged just hundreds of legionnaires before. And he came out there and he was far from his home. He wanted to go back to Italy. He was tired. He was tired of foreign wars. He was tired of being in a place he didn't like, a bunch of people he didn't understand with customs that were weird. And this was a chance for him to take out some of his animosity and frustration against the leader of these Jews. So he walked up to this task with real relish, you know. And he took out this big old whip and he shook it out. And he looked at Jesus and he measured his distance from Jesus to him. And he took this scourge and he took his big muscled arm and he brought it up. And he brought that whip whistling down on Jesus' back. And the tongues of that scourge, they wrapped themselves around Jesus' body and they stuck into him and the pieces of metal clawed at him. The length of each one of the thongs had been coated with sheep's blood and bits of pottery, had broken pottery and stuff had been kind of glued to each one. So each strand just stuck onto Jesus and clawed into his flesh and the tips of the, of the, of the scourge ends, the lead tips would cut into him and gouge him. And when the man had a good bite on Jesus, he would twist the whip and pull so that great big chunks of meat were ripped off of Jesus' body and he was cut open. And Jesus took 39 stripes like that. 39 times that man's arm came up and fell. 39 times that whip bit into Jesus. At the middle of the scourging, the man had to change and whip Jesus on the other side because one side of his body had already been reduced to raw hamburger meat and there just wasn't enough sound flesh left to beat. The historian of the day says that Jesus Christ was reduced to human rubble 
It says, the, the histories of the day say that there was not one inch on Jesus' body that wasn't cut or bruised or bleeding or, or gashed open or something. Then they cut him down. And the executioner gave the rest of the legionnaires a chance to take out some of their frustrations. Someone had called him the king of the Jews, so one of the Roman legionnaires went and got a, a purple robe. And they flung it over Jesus' battered body. And it was on there, and they got, a, they got a crown made out of thorns. And the thorns were about like this, about, oh, about five to six inches long. And they were hard as nails, old Judean thorns. And they braided a crown for him and they stuck it up on his head and they beat it down around his ears with rods until it was just stuck into his scalp and stuck into his head and gouging into his face. And they put a scepter in his hand and they mocked him and they spit on him and they pulled out his beard in fistfuls. And they called him a king and laughed at him. And the Bible says they smote him in the face. And the Greek word there that they use for the word to smite is the same Greek word that they use for striking a man with a closed fist. It's the word or the root word for the word pugilism, which means boxing. And it was striking Jesus in the face with a fist. They punched Jesus out. The whole company did. When they got done with that, they drug him back in and gave him back to the Roman procurator named Pilate. And Pilate brought him out to the crowd. This was the same crowd that a week before had hailed him as Messiah. It said that they'd love him, that they would follow him, that they'd stick by him. Pilate brought him out to the crowd and stood him before the crowd. And next to him stood a condemned murderer named Barabbas. And Pilate says, it's Passover time. I'll give you either one of these men you want. I'll give you this murderer, Barabbas, or I'll give you this man here in whom I can find no fault. I'll give you Jesus, who is supposed to be your king. Now, which do you want? And on top of the scourging, on top of the humiliation, on top of the pain and the loss of blood, Jesus had to stand there and watch the people he loved turn his, their back on him and scream for the release of Barabbas. He had to stand there and watch while he was deserted by everybody he cared for. And he had to stand there and listen to the shouts of, Give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Crucify him. We want Barabbas. Then they took him out and they ripped that purple robe off his back after they had a chance to congeal with the blood. And it ripped every one of Jesus' wounds open again and he began to bleed all over again. And they put his own robe on his back. They settled a 200-pound cross on his back and made him walk up the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows it's called now. But it's the street in Jerusalem that's probably the steepest one there. And as he started making his way up there, he was weak, he was beaten, he was deserted, his disciples weren't even in the area. And he fell. It was just too much. The emotional strain, a loss of blood. He fell under his cross. And a man stepped out of the crowd, a man named Simon of Cyrene. And the Bible says, doesn't say what nationality he was, but tradition says that he was a black man. And this man came out and picked the cross up, took it up for Jesus and carried it the west of the way to Golgotha, to Calvary, the place of the skull. And they put that cross down on the ground and they ripped Jesus' robe off his back again and made him bleed again. They threw him down naked on the cross. They stretched his arms out. They got an eight-inch spike. They took that eight-inch spike and they placed it in the middle of the lower part of his hands where the small bones are. So they took that nail. They put his hand against the wood. They put a foot in his palm put the nail down in the heel of his hand and took this big mallet and they drove that nail through his flesh and bones into that wood. And then they stretched out his other hand and they did the same. And then they did his feet. They took one foot, placed it on top of the other, in step to sole. Then they took a 12-inch spike. They put it in the middle of his top insep, drove it out through both feet and out through his back heel. 
had nailed him to the cross. And he, they, then they picked up that cross. They picked it up and they dropped it into a hole in the ground. And they brought wedges out and nailed the wedges in and Jesus hung between heaven and earth. As he hung on his hands in his weakened condition, the pain was such that it ran down his arms into his chest and caused massive diaphragm spasms and pinched off his lungs so that he couldn't breathe. And so the only way that Jesus could get relief from that was to push all of his weight up on the nail in his feet and stand upright and gasp a couple of gasps of air. And it was during those times that he pushed himself upright to gasp for air that he said such things as, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, it wasn't just for the Roman soldiers he said that. He was looking all the way down through history, and he was looking right at you. Right at you, sister, and right at you, brother, and right at you two sisters and you, brother. He was looking at me and every one of us that he was hanging on that cross for because he wasn't just hanging on the cross for the previous sins of the world or even for the sins of the world that he lived in. He was hanging on the cross for, for your sins and my sins too. And finally, he pushed himself up for one last time and he said, it is finished. And his head fell forward on his chest and he slumped back down in his arms for the last time and he died. He'd live for three hours on the cross that way, if you call that life. And when he died, he chose the time and hour and place of his death. Because when he died, he gave his spirit up. And his mother and his brothers came, and they took him down. And by brothers, I mean his friends. And they took him down, and they put him in a borrowed tomb because the Lord of glory could not afford a hole in the ground. He didn't have enough money to even afford a grave. And they put him in that place and they rolled a stone in front of it. They put a great big blob of red sealing wax up there. They got the big Roman Imperator, you know, the seal of the emperor. And they stuck that big eagle in there and made this big eagle symbol on the grave. Posted a Roman guard and said, anybody that breaks this seal, will put them to death immediately. Because they knew the stories that had got to them even where they were, what was intended. And they didn't want anybody to steal Jesus' body. And it got dark. And it got quiet. And from the shadows stepped a figure. His name was Satan. And he walked over in front of that grave and he looked at the stone and the seal. He crossed his arms across his chest. He reared back and he said, Ha! I've won. Well, God, what now? I've won. What a fool. You've sent your own, your own son like a lamb to the slaughter. Ha! You think this loving, kind individual could beat me? I've won. I always knew I'd won anyway. This is going to stomp my head? <laughs> He's dead. He's beaten. He's in a hole in the ground. Nobody could get him out of there. <laughs> I've won. Finally, after all these years, all the way since Genesis 3.15, I've been fighting this fight, and I finally won. <sighs> Gia, all I'm good at is fighting God. I, I don't really know what to do with myself now that I got the Messiah taken care of. I, hmm, I guess I have time off. What should I do with time off? I've never had time off before. I know. I saw some people do this once and it really looked good and I think maybe I, I've got some time off, I'll do it. I think I'll have a picnic. Sounds good, I'll have a picnic. And so the devil went down to hell and he got his big picnic basket, see? And he got all the stuff in it that devils like, you know? Deviled eggs and deviled ham and a big jar of jalapeno peppers, the hottest ones you can get, you know? Stuck them right in the old basket and he started to walk out of hell and he remembered 
he says, hey, man, I got a big corporation here. I can't just walk out and leave it unattended. So he got on his intercom, you know, and he got hold of his secretary. Her name's Demona. He said, hey, Demona. He says, I want you to call up my two lieutenants, uh, Death and Corruption. You know, Corruption, his other name is Grave. And I want you to send him over, to send him over here to me because I want to leave him in charge while I go on my, my holiday here. So old Demona got hold of him and they came up to the office and reported, you know, and uh, the devil said, Death, he said, I got a special job for you. He said, I want you to take over hell while I'm gone on my picnic. He says, but the special job I got is, he says, I got that uh, Jew up there, Jesus, and he's in this hole in the ground. And like he is really dead, man. And I want you to make sure he stays that way. I mean, I want you to wrap yourself around him and I want you to hold on to him like you never held on to anybody before. And death said, well, man, who have I ever let go? He says, I know I missed Enoch, but I turned my head and he was gone. What could I do? And he said, and I tried to catch that Elijah cat and I burned the sleeves right off my best robe because them fiery chariots are a bummer, you know. <laughs> but the thing about it is, anybody I've ever got my old bony fingers on, I've still got. And then the devil turned around to corruption. He says, okay. He says, now death's going to hold him. Now corruption, he says, what I want you to do, he says, is I want you to just like dissolve him to dirt. Just, you know, dissolve him to ashes and just blow him away because I don't want to even have any traces of Jesus left when I get back. And, and old corruption said, well, man, anybody he can hold, I can rot, you know. And so the devil left and he, he went and he had a great picnic and it lasted for three days. And then he came back to hell he was all happy because he won, you know, and he came in whistling, you know. <laughs> you know, that's just a song I made up. Don't anybody think it's rock and roll? Uh, I, know, uh, I know everybody thinks that the rock and roll is of the devil. Anyway, he was whistling and everything like that. And uh, he came up and he unlocked the big old gates of hell and he pushed them open and he, he locked them back up, you know, he shut them and he locked them up, you know, and he walked off down the uh, corridor there and uh, he got down by his office, you know, and he walked around the corner by his office and there was his two lieutenants, old death and corruption. They were standing there going. Hi, have a nice uh, trip. <laughs> and the devil said, don't tell me something went wrong. And death said, well, he said, uh, sorry, boss. I mean, I really tried to hold Jesus, but uh, there was something about him. I, I couldn't hold him. Corruption said, yeah. He says, that was weird. I couldn't even touch him. Not only could I not put corruption on him, I couldn't even touch him. And while these three old uglies were sitting there talking, a devil looked down one of them long, dark corridors in hell, the longest, ugliest, blackest pit in hell, where there had been suffering from the beginning of time. He looked way down at the bottom of that pit, and for the very first time ever, a little light came on. And that light shone out bright way down there in the pit, and it started coming toward the old devil and old death and corruption. And as it came forward, it got bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter, and bigger, and bigger. And the really weird thing was that every time one of these beams of light would hit one of the cell doors, you know, where the, where the spirits of the people were kept, well, a cell door would just pop open. And those people would come out, and they'd be praising God, and they would be singing Hosanna, and they'd be singing Hallelujah, and they'd be glorifying the name of the Lord. And everything was just in chaos and people were running free and hell was all lit up and the devil was shaking all over and he looked way down in the deep part of that light to see where it was coming from and guess who it was that was coming striding through the, through the corridors of hell. Well, it was Jesus. That was who. It wasn't the beaten, crucified the Jew of the cross, but it was the risen, glorified Lord of glory, the one that's called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And man, he came striding through the old, old corridors in hell, man, and all the people were with him, and they were all shouting hallelujah and praise God, and old Jesus walked right up to the old corruption, and he grabbed him in this hand, and he threw him that way, and he grabbed old death around the neck and threw him that way, and he reached out and grabbed the old devil by the front of his shirt, shook him three times real good and hard, and said, hand over them keys turkey you know and I tell you man <laughs> the 
And so the old devil went down and got the keys to death, hell, and the grave out. You know, this big old key ring he had. He went through the A's and the B's and C's and D's, and he got down to the J's, you know, and he got off the one that said Jesus and Nazareth on it. And Jesus took it, and he looked at it, and he said, well, that's pretty good. He says, but uh, see, I can see into the future, which is something you can't do, devil, because if you could have seen in the future, you'd never had me crucified, because that's what we had in mind the whole time. And uh, if you could see in the future, you could see way down here, Way down August 22nd, 1966, in a mop closet, Navy boot camp, there's a fellow by the name of Mike Warnke. And he's going to need his key. And so while I'm here, old devil, why don't you just give me Mike Warnke's key too? As a matter of fact, as I see into the future, I see there are a lot of Mike Warnke's. A lot of people who are going to need their keys. So while I'm here, I'll just take them all. And he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. He shoved Satan aside. He went up and put his hand in the middle of the gates of hell and pushed him over. Boom! And he walked out. And he led all of those people that had been captive free. And he went up to heaven. And right on the corner of Faith Avenue and Hallelujah Boulevard, he opened this key shop. <laughs> and it's been doing a jam-up business for 2,000 years, man. Just jam up. <laughs> so the message, message we have for you is not how to be religious, not how to be holier than thou, not how to be better than the next guy, or not how to be uh, so heavenly conscious, you're not earthly good. The message we have to you is, there is a key shop. And your job, as long as you live, is to take the key that you've got the one that not only fit your chains, but it fit your ignition too. Because if you work it just right, when you get set free, you can get turned on at the same time. You know what I mean? <laughs> and keep chugging for the Lord. And when you see a person just like you, go up and say, hey man, see this key? I know where you can get one that'll fit what you need too. That's our job as Christians. And that's what you're looking for. Those of you that are out there and you're really searching and looking for the answer, the key is what you need. We're not preaching church. We're not preaching religion. We're preaching giving Jesus a chance to fit a key to your lock and set you free. Thank you.